Thank you so much, everyone, and congratulations. You have chosen definitely the best session because I'm going to tell you about impact. I think that was the topic about how do we get to impact from all different types of civic tech. So I'm going to show you some quite powerful impact figures, I hope, today. So thank you. That was a smashing introduction on open contracting. Um, but why public procurement? It's actually, in some ways, quite a dull, obscure topic. And yet, it's absolutely vital. And the reason why is it's where the money and the power is in government. So uh, governments contracting with private businesses is 9.5 trillion US dollars every year. So to give you an idea of that, that would be a stack of $1 bills, American dollars, all the way to the moon and back. So it's an unbelievably large amount of money spent every year. It's central to delivering goods and services to citizens. Um, and also, it's government's number one corruption risk. So this slide is just on some of the challenges that uh, public procurement faces. So it's worth saying sort of 60% uh, of foreign bribery cases have involved bribery for public contracts. Um, and even outside issues like bribery, there's also just a huge problem with government inefficiency and ineffectiveness. Uh, this is an example of a public uh, contract that's gone horribly wrong in Lithuania. Now, can anyone see what's, what's wrong about this picture? So, yes, there are no stalls. Also, it's in fact a child's gymnasium. So it's actually meant to be a changing room for children. And as you can see, someone's filled the entire thing full of lavatories. So it gives you some idea of, even outside corruption, just general government inefficiency and mismanagement in public procurement is huge. So open contracting is a... As you said, a silo-busting collaboration trying to prevent all that. And at its heart are two things. One is better open data on public contracts, much better public disclosure of contracting information, both the, uh, the documents and the processes that underpin public procurement. And equally importantly, then, is better, smarter engagement of businesses and citizens around the public contracting process. So there can actually be feedback and discussion generated around public contracting. Problems can be identified and fixed. Um, open contracting isn't certain things as well. So although we work on open data and we work on better collaboration and better engagement, it's not an e-procurement solution in itself. So lots of you will know e-procurement, the way that governments kind of create electronic marketplaces. Open contracting can kind of accelerate those, increase competition and make them better, but it's not actually a one-stop shop for e-procurement itself. It's not also a top-down mechanism where civil society sits alongside government to negotiate each individual contract. It's not about trying to replicate freedom of information laws. They're really important. They exist. How can we go from reactive disclosure through FOIAs through proactive disclosure of information? And I think uh, IAFEMA will be talking about that in Nigeria a bit later. And lastly, there are some legitimate reasons for confidentiality and privacy in contracting, just um, not that many. So we do a lot of work in myth-busting around commercial confidentiality. And we find there's a lot of... Um, uh, myths out there that if you do this, this will affect competition, businesses won't bid for contracts. It simply isn't true, and I'll show you evidence of why it isn't true later. So we try to work in a collaborative, multi-stakeholder way, and um, particularly around user engagement and tool development on open contracting. We're not contractors ourselves. We don't build things for government. We are a kind of a, a hub and accelerator talking about the value of open contracting. And one of the key things we offer governments is the open contracting data standard. So just to explain what this is, it's a user-friendly open data schema. Just uh, explains people how to release both the documents and the data for every stage of public contracting. And this is quite important. It's how you join the information from the planning through to the tender and award of public contracts, the contracts themselves, how you disclose those, and then very importantly, the actual implementation of the contract. What are the key milestones? What are the payments in relation to that? There's a lot that goes wrong from the tendering through to the award, but there's also a lot that goes wrong even at the planning stage about what are you trying to build, what are you trying to procure, and why are you trying to procure that? You can, for example, you know, stack the specifications to favor one supplier. 
And there's also a lot that goes wrong around the implementation of public contracts. I think every country in the world, I know the UK has very many of these, public contracts that have become hugely more expensive than they're meant to be with mismanagement at almost every stage along the public contracting chain. And so the data standard is a way to join this information together, but also to make it machine readable and also user friendly. And it was built around matching the supply of information from governments, looking at best practices in disclosure, to the demand and the four key user needs around public contracting. One is value for money. How would government compare different line items in public contracts to say we were buying this many chairs here and it's the same unit price as this many chairs here? How do you also then look through uh, public contracts for red flags to do with awards to um, corrupt awards or awards where there might be fraud involved? So that public integrity issue, how would you screen public contracts at scale in a machine readable way for that information? How do you then track the milestones and delivery of public contracts? And lastly, and also very importantly, creating a level playing field for businesses. How do you actually put information into businesses' hands that allows them to, A, understand what the government is buying and when the government is buying, uh, but also how to actually bid for contracts and win them? Uh, there's a big challenge, I think, yeah, globally in the actual uh, competitiveness of public procurement markets. And so the Open Contracting Data Standard provides a sort of unique structured data records and releases around that information. I've talked about, I've just um, listed some of the things here, from the documents and notices associated with public procurement through to actually the buyers, the suppliers, and the organizations involved. That could link, for example, to the beneficial ownership, who really owns the companies, the key dates, the contract values, the line items, their classification, and the milestones and their performance. It's a progressive schema. It's not a pass or fail. Uh, we work in many different countries around the world, and public procurement information is in quite different states in those countries. So we try to say, here's how you can begin to share information, and here's how you get better, here's how you link it to other data sets, here's how you might link the budget information through to the contracting information, and how that then might link to the corporate registry. And then it's structured JSON data, which I think most of you will know here. Um, it's often taken from existing e-procurement systems, but it can also work offline as well. That gives you some idea what it looks like. One's a flattened version, uh, the other one's the JSON. And the reason why it's structured data is because there's lots of one-to-many relationships in public procurement. So one contract can yield many different sort of uh, procurements and subcontracting relationships underneath it. You need to be able to capture those hierarchically. Also, the data changes over time, so different points of government may amend the contracting record. So again, you need an authoritative sort of tree of who's changed the contract at what point. Now, it's an uh, uh, exciting time for open contracting. There's over 25, you know, it's actually now 30 countries around the world who are nominally interested in exploring open contracting. Of these, we reckon about half will properly implement the open contracting data standard, and we should then be able to measure uh, impact in about half of those again. We'll get decent baselines and metrics on performance and implementation. But it's, uh, it's interesting seeing where it's catching on. I think IFIM will be telling you about Nigeria and Budeshi later, uh, but there's lots of other countries there, and I'm going to talk about some of those in a moment. But first, um, I want to take you back to the early inspiration for open contracting, which is Slovakia. So this is the Slovak Republic uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, people are on the streets and they're marching, and they are complaining around corruption in public contracting. You can see there, people are holding up things saying, gorilla, ni. Uh, and that's basically no to the gorilla files. The gorilla files were... Um, a series of recordings that reveal very high-level government corruption. Um, and this is obviously, I uh, notice our Brazilian friends here smiling, very, very similar situation to the Petrobras scandal, if you like. It was uh, related to both state and enterprises and government procurement uh, benefiting politicians directly. Um, and so people launched a massive public protests around this, and the government needed to do something around creating more transparency around public contracting. What they did was they changed the law and then um, such that a public contract was not um, official and was not enforceable until such a time it had been published. And they created then a website to, after the event, publish those contracts. And this is the website. What is really interesting is the impacts that that had. And the first impact was, amazingly, the sky didn't fall in. Publishing public contracts uh, turned out to be not only possible, but actually highly effective and highly feasible. 
It did take NGOs to scrape the data and make it really accessible and train the media how to use that information. But then it was really fascinating to see what the effects were. One effect is they uncovered large amounts of waste and excess. Uh, there are tales of cognac, luxury cars, extravagant bills for flowers and uh, foreign seafood at a time when, in fact, the budget of the education ministry, who was spending all this money, was, in fact, being cut. There was direct corruption exposed. Um, hospital scanners were being procured by shell companies linked to politicians, and they were charging twice as much for those scanners as other hospitals. Um, but then other interesting impacts started happening too. So there was actually a measurable increase in competition. And it turned out this information was really valuable to small businesses trying to research the government market. And in fact, um, they say that the uh, number of bids doubled, and technically it did, that's the mean number of bids. What's perhaps worth looking at is that um, basically um, the number of single source bids also decreased. So there were two effects that were going on. One is that businesses were tending to bid more for government contracts, but equally importantly, the added value of the transparency was making governments think more about their procurements process, or government departments in this case, and actually sole sourcing less of their public contracts. This was measured from 2011, when the publication started, to 2014. And then lastly, as well as businesses bidding, there turned out to be actually quite significant public interest in contracts. And they did a survey, there's Transparency International, asking people who looked at public contracts in the last year, and 9% of people did. It was mostly for small local contracts related to schools, to roads, and things like that. But um, it was really interesting evidence that uh, open contracting approach can work. Um, but as you saw, it was post hoc publication, so it was a good lesson for open contracting about how do you open up this data in real time to actually have more of an impact on the deal making process as it goes on rather than just publishing after the event. And I'm going to tell you about that impact in just a moment. So if I was to summarize open contracting in two pictures, this is number one. This is the uh, procurement ministry. Um, uh, this is uh, from Ukraine in this case. Um, and they move from an old Soviet system to integrating open contracting right into the heart of their reforms after the Maidan revolution that happened in late 2014, early 2015. And they built a fantastic e-procurement system with open contracting at its heart. And it was called ProZoro, which means transparent. Everyone sees everything as their motto. And the impacts have been really quite remarkable. So they've seen, hundreds of, they've seen thousands of new businesses enter the supply market as they begin to see more transparency and openness around public procurement. They've seen that bidders with over three... Um, uh, tenders with over three bidders have saved up to 20%, uh, and they've saved about 10% on each individual tender. They've seen a very clear correlation between responsiveness to different government departments to questions uh, to the actual success of those tenders. The perception of corruption amongst entrepreneurs in public procurement has basically dropped from 54% to 29%. They've seen hundreds of thousands of queries around public procurement now being raised through Google and through others. Uh, and they've seen a whole rise of citizen feedback monitoring. And they've seen dozens of new marketplaces actually created to run the tenders for ProZoro. And going back to those big figures on the previous page, as well as the thousands of new suppliers, they've seen savings of over one billion US dollars. So integrating open contracting into the heart of procurement reform has been really impactful and using open contracting as the data model. Um, just want to emphasize one thing, data is the start and not the end. So, um, ProZoro both relies on the open contracting data standard, but it also involved a huge public communication campaign to encourage small businesses to bid. And this is an example of the public communication campaign. So zipping ever so quickly through a couple of other slides, this is caught on, you now have apps for business in Paraguay, you have the Czech Republic using it to rate procurement entities, people now tracking multi-billion dollar telecom PPPs in Mexico, City of Montreal after corruption scandal has been using open contracting. I'll jump through that one. So cutting to a long uh, sort of uh, story short, I think the revolution in public contracting will be digitized. I think the impacts can be huge. The benefits are low and the costs are high. In Ukraine, the cost benefit was something like $1. Uh, it cost 5 million US dollars in total for the ProZor reforms. The benefit was over a billion, so that's one to about uh, 205. Um, it involves not only just data, but thinking about change management and really meeting user needs directly and actually speaking to businesses about how they access this information, how civil society will use it for citizen monitoring. And lastly, it probably works best embedded in systematic reforms. Um, and there's different models of how you can do things. Uh, but there you go. There's a quick summary of it. And thank you very much.